I did think when my kids started to drive that maybe it wasn't such a good idea having them play Mario Karts before they got their real license, you know, because that's liable to, I don't know, in a traffic jam, they're liable to, like, throw a banana peel out the, out the back of the car or something. And, all right, anyhow, enough of this nonsense. I suspect what was going on here Tuesday was just issues with, with the versions of it because I did some things and all that. They updated the version in here uh, to match the version in the lab, and I had a lot better luck doing what I needed to do. So we'll pick up on that. I did, I had intended to post the next assignment Monday in here, which I didn't. So what I did is I backed up the assignment that was supposed to be due yesterday and make it due Friday. And then I posted the next assignment, but instead of being due Wednesday, I made it due Friday. And I hope to have a, the next assignment after that posted uh, sometime today, I hope, because I'm going out of town this weekend. So um, I hope I can get it done today. I know you're not complaining if I don't post a new assignment, you know. Okay, so I did pretty much what I recalled I said I was going to do uh, in the example. So let's download it and look at it. And the theme, if there is a theme of these lectures, it's how to take what we've learned from scaffolding, from looking at the code that gets scaffold, and adapt it to do other stuff that we might want to do that's similar but a little different than the code that was scaffold, if that makes sense. Because it's, the scaffolding does a really great job for us like from, for some very basic functionality. All right? Uh, but, again, most websites are going to have a lot more extensive functionality than that. So what my goal is over the next few times is to say, okay, Scaffolding gives us this sort of default behavior to do certain things, and it does that pretty well, but we're almost never going to do that out of the box. We might use that for part of our site, but there's going to be stuff that we're going to have to code on our own. So, but yeah, scaffolding is a great tutorial for you. Because when I was looking, when I was doing stuff and I wasn't sure how to do something, it's like, well, let's see. That reminds me of something on the edit page. Let's go look at the edit page. So I kind of did that, and as I'm going through this, I'll kind of review that sort of thing. So let me download this. open it up. I'm going to go and create the database.
thinking about it, deciding it if it's going to make my day hard or not today. Eh, it said, eh, we messed enough with them on Tuesday. We'll let them go this time. So what I have is I have a database. I created the model that has uh, three tables in it, a league, a team, and a player. So this assumes that this is like for a city or something, and, uh, you know, um, you can enter in leagues, and you can enter in teams associated with the leagues, and then you can enter in uh, players associated with the team. So let's go in and put some data in. Now, I realize that um, one thing I did not do here is I didn't create any seed data. They talk about in the book uh, or in the tutorial creating some seed data so we don't have to go through this process of entering data every time. All right, We can regenerate the database structure, but we want to also regenerate the data. The other thing that I'm not going to do right now, well, actually I should do this right now, is I should go in and create the relationships in the database. All right? You still want to do this every single time. All right? We should uh, have file scripts that we can run to recreate the database and receive the data. Uh, and we'll talk about that probably next week. But I can go in here and server explore, no. SQL Object Explorer, that's right. And here's my database. There we go. Tables. And we see we have DBO League, DBO Player, DBO Team. All right. Uh, if we look in the league, our columns are the ID and the league name. If we look in the team, the columns are the ID, the team name, and the league ID. All right. So I want to make sure that that's a foreign key. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to pull this up. And foreign keys I can add. And my foreign key, team to League and the column League ID, that's the column in the um, in this table, that's the column in the team table, points to the league table And the column name it points to in there is ID. So someone asked a question. I forget who asked the question, but someone asked the question, did the names in the, in the things have to be the same? In other words, did it have to be called League ID in both tables? And the answer is no. All right, the answer is no. You actually create the association. All right. Now I can click the update. And what that's going to do is that's going to look to see what's different. What have I changed between the current database and now? So I click update. And it thinks, hmm, what did he change? Ah, the only thing he changed is he created a foreign key. So I'll then go and update the database to create the foreign key. So now the foreign key is actually in the database. I should do the same thing for 
the relationship between player and team. So I pull up the player, click on foreign keys, add new foreign key, player to team, and the foreign key field is team ID, and that refers to the table team and the column ID. And I can update it and generate script. That's going to generate the script for this table. And I can update it and it'll add the foreign key. Okay, so now I'm good to go. So let's put some data in here and we're not gonna spend time putting in tons of data. I'm just gonna put in a couple of leagues, a couple of uh, teams uh, for each league, a couple of players and we'll go from there. So let me go and run this. I went by the way and I edited my menu. <coughs> and I edited the home page. I think I did too good a job editing the home page because I got rid of almost everything with the navigation. All right. There is for leaks, and we can create new, and we'll put in co ed softball. 18 to 34. This should be pretty standard stuff. This is what we did with scaffolding. to teams and create new uh, the Tigers let's say are in team one notice that that's not really how we would want it to be we're entering in the primary key of the league I, uh, table ideally we should have a drop down what happens if we put in something or we try to put in something that doesn't match and we hit create we get an ugly error, all right, because we violated the primary key. Now, that's something we're going to want to change, all right, because we don't want to display these kind of long, ugly errors. We want to display more user-friendly errors. Ultimately, we're going to take care of this by putting a drop-down on the page, all right? We just haven't gotten to that part yet. So... I'll say the Tigers are in League One. And because I know there is a League One, everything's okay. We'll also say the Bears are in Team One. And the Lions are in League Two. Okay? Lions and Tigers and Bears. Can I try that again? Lions and Tigers and Bears? Thank you. Thank you. Please, laugh at my jokes even if you don't think they're funny. All right. It does, it's, it does so much for the teacher's attitude to do that. Uh, anyhow, we're going to players, and I'm going to create a new player, and... I still have to remember IDs, so I'll put that in. Huh. Shouldn't be.
Interesting. It generated generate them with three and four for the ID. I would have thought it generated for one and two. Oh well, live and learn. Okay, uh, we'll add another person. It's also on team three. And do with this under edit I made a drop down all right under edit I made a drop down all right and the drop down I can select the team that they belong to and hit save and it changes it in the database let's take a look to see how I did that that's actually the topic of this week's assignment and the tutorial that I posted this week, how to do a drop down. So I only did it to the edit page. Notice that unfortunately the edit and the create page are two different pages. Therefore, uh, therefore, um, to do this right, I would have to do it both for the create and for the edit. Could we customize and have a single page to edit and create? And the answer to almost every question where could we is yeah, we probably could. And maybe we'll look at doing that at some point. All right? Uh, we're just going to have to be smart enough to know what mode the page needs to be in. All right? But yeah, we could go in that. That'll be something we can put on our mental list of things that we want to go in. But anyhow, let's go and look at the drop down. Now to look at the drop down, here's what I did when I did this, literally. All right. I said, hmm, on what page have I gotten a list of teams? Well, this page. This page has a list of teams. Therefore, there's probably logic on this page that I need to put in to this page. So I went and looked for the logic on this page that gave me a list of teams. All right, that's the first thing I did. The second thing I did is looked at the tutorial for how to create a drop down. All right, and what's more, not just how to create a drop down, but how to create a drop down that ties to the database. Because when I go and I change the value in the dropdown. I'm not just changing the value in the dropdown. I want to change it to the database. I want to update it in the database. All right. That's called, it used to be called in the old days of .NET, two-way binding. In other words, when I read it, I select the right one. And after I change it, it updates it. So coming in to display the page, going out to out update the page. It's connected between that database column and the dropdown. So let's go and look at this. <coughs> There's no ID for the tigers. Weird. Oh, it's two. Wonder why. All right, anyhow, enough mysteries. Um, we will go in and look at the edit page for player. So 
Under edit pa uh, under pages for players, I'm going to look at the edit page. And I'm going to look at the edit model. Really is a tiny monitor they give us here in the classroom. Let's look first at the model. Remember, what is the model's job? The page model's job. The page model's job is to supply data for the razor page. All right? So this guy's job is to supply data to the razor page. So, one thing I have is I have a public list of select list items that I've called options. All right? Options is the variable name. The type of the variable is a list. And the greater than and less than brackets indicate a list of what? How many of you have seen this syntax before? Where you have the name of a object and then you have in brackets in these triangle brackets or greater than a lesson sign you have the name of the object usually it's done with lists all right this specifies that we have a list this specifies what each item on the list is and what each item in this list is is it's a list of select list items all right remember an html select statement has a list of options associated with it. I think it's important to always think about the HTML that you're going to produce here. So if I look up HTML select, a select contains a list of options. Each one of them, each option, contains two things. All right, contains two things. It contains the text of the option, which is what the user is going to see. It also contains the value of the option, which any script is going to see. All right. So in this case, it's not a big difference, but the, the, the text of this first option is Volvo with a capital V. The value is Volvo with a lowercase v. What this is implying is that in whatever database that this is probably connected to, that Volvo with the lowercase v is probably the key to the automobile type field, and so on. So usually when this is related to a related table, this is going to be something descriptive that the user is going to understand. This is going to be what the database or the script requires. So in our case, we have a drop down for team. What do you think the text of the option should be? What does it make sense to show as the text of the option for team? The team name. What does it make sense to show the value of? The ID. the ID. Almost always it's going to be something like that, right? The ID or whatever the key is, is going to be the value, right? Because remembering how foreign keys work, the value of the ID is what we're going to want to stuff in the database. So in order to link a player to a team, we have a column in the player called team ID, and we need to put the ID of that team in that field. All right? Yet, no one's going to know what team 1 is, or team 2 is, or team 3, or 4, or whatever. All right? Therefore, you need to display something that's meaningful to the user. 
So that's where you display the description, the name, something that makes sense to the user. So let's look at our example here. That's what a select list item is. A select list item is an object that contains two parts. A value and a description. Let's look up that object. can't find a real good example here to show me what I'm looking at. Well, All right, this gets rendered as an option tag. That's the HTML that gets created. This has two different, or four different kinds of constructors. This is a constructor we're interested in. Two strings. The first string is going to be the value that's going to be, or is going to be the, the text that's displayed. The second string is going to be the value. All right. So. And this actually shows you a complete description. I like to show this documentation to make you aware of it. This kind of documentation isn't necessarily the best way to learn stuff. Usually you can find tutorials or examples that explain it more thoroughly. But this is kind of like the, the how do I want to say it? This is kind of like, this is the real definition of this class. This is the actual official from Microsoft, the description of what's in this class. So this is like the definitive final word. And it's a little tricky to, to read these, and it takes practice. So I like to point these out just to make you aware of that, to take the time and look at some of these. And you'll get more used to reading them, and you can get some really good information from them. All right. So that's what I have. I have a select, I have a list of select list items that is called options. These are the options that I'm going to use to feed well, I get those options here. And this is a bit of a mouthful. Options equals underscore context team select. To list. Wow, that's a, that's a mouthful. Let's bring up Notepad++ and we'll kind of dissect it. Because you can copy and paste code and you might even be able to get the results that you want. But then it becomes difficult for you to understand really what's going on if you ever have to change it or make it to do something else. All right, so options, that's the list that we just defined, okay, good. Context, that is our database, all right, essentially. 
where you see context, that is our database schema or model or whatever. From it, we want to pull information from the team entity. What do we want to do? We want to do a select. Now, interesting, uh, in retrospect, I spent a lot of time talking about SQL. But we're really not looking a lot at SQL. We're looking at functions that create the SQL for us. Well, I don't really regret teaching the SQL, though, because it's valuable for us to know that, to know what's going on behind the scenes. There are times when we need to write SQL, and it will be good to know it. All right. What is this? This is a different kind of this is a different kind of code than we've likely ever seen. Has anyone ever seen code like this before in another class? C sharp. You might have seen it in C sharp. Yeah. Especially advanced C sharp. You might have seen it in Java, although I don't think I teach it in Java one. This is called a lambda expression. All right. A lambda expression is a way that we could treat a piece of code like data. And we can use a piece of code as an argument in a function. All right? Select is a function. Oh, people are noisy today. It's distracting me. So what does this mean? And we'll look up the official documentation later. A select statement is going to return a list of rows. What this is saying is every row that gets returned, we're going to call A. All right? A is the list of rows that we're returning. The, the data set, the result set. That little kind of arrow expression means it's like a transformation. We're going to transform that row into a selected list item object. Okay? So we could do a lot of things with it. But what we need in this case is a select list item object, right? Why do we need that? Because that's what you populate a dropdown with, a list of select list items. That's what we defined options as being, all right? So therefore, somehow or other, we have to take what we've retrieved and turn that into a bunch of select list objects. We don't have to do it this way. This is just a very concise, simple, straightforward way to do it. If we didn't do this this way, what we would do is we would retrieve a list of rows from the database. We would loop through them with a for, a for loop. And for each time through the for loop, we'd get the next value from the list would create a select list object, would populate the fields for it, and would do that for every item in there. This does that like in one swoop. In one swoop, this takes every row that's returned and makes a select list item object for us. And then that we're turning into a list. So we're taking the output of all this stuff, all of these <coughs> select list objects, select list item objects, we're forming a list of them so that we can put that in our options variable. Let's look up.
instance is using this link to entities which allow us to query things in a basic way. This way, for example, is a way to query things and add a WHERE clause to it. I don't really see a good, I don't want to spend too much time searching for that. But I think we can see in a nutshell, and we'll see more of these as the course goes on. This means take every row that's returned and sort of map it, transform it into a new select object. Accumulate up all those and turn them into a list. So when we're done, options has a list of select list items. Now if we go and look at, that's it. All right. Notice the context got created when the edit model got created. It got past the Context. So it knows what database to pull from. This is what entity we're pulling from. Select is what we're doing. And this is how we're processing the data that we select. It's kind of neat. These are kind of different. Uh, I have to admit they're fairly new to me. I first encountered them when I started teaching the Java 2 class uh, for Akron because we study Lambda expressions in that too. And immediately, it wasn't clear, like, the benefit of them. Because you don't need them. We could write a loop to do this. But it's nice to do it in a very concise way. And once you get used to the uh, syntax of them, they're very powerful. Okay, so that's the model's job. The model's job is to prepare this list, which we did through this statement. If we look at the CSHTML, the Razor page itself, we have a little bit different than the other ones. The other ones have simply a text box, input, ASP4, player first name, and then a class. This we have a select, ASP4, player team. ASP items model dot options. All right. Let's look at this and make sure we understand what's going on here. ASP4, this attribute, is mapping this, binding this, select to the database column team ID in the player entity. The attribute team ID in the player entity. And model options, the ASP dash items, is where we're getting the values for this. So where do we get the values? Well, we get it from the model. That's where we get the values for everything, right? What are we, so this gives us our list of possible values, this gives us where we put the selected value. So we get our values from the model.options, which was that whole 
business of selecting stuff from the team table, making select list items from it. The ASP4 is where we're putting it when we're done with it. Where do we pull it from? Where do we put it? And that's the entity column where the results are, which is ASP, uh, which is player.team. Questions about this? Work through an example of this, and, and, and again, that's what is part for the homework to do on uh, uh, tomorrow, is to do a drop down like this. So if we wanted to do this on the create, all right, we should be able to do this fairly simply on the create. So let's do this to like copy the code, just to, 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 to review this in more detail. I'm going to look at the player create. And the player create right now has a text box for the team ID, all right? We don't want a text box for the ID. We want a drop down. So let's look at the model. We have to, as always, change two things. All right. All right, we have to change two things. We have to change the model and the page itself. So the model I'm going to copy the code that creates the options. And I'm going to put that in the on get. Now that's giving me an error because I also have to copy the attribute over. So the model should be set. The model's doing what the other model did. When we load the page, we're going to get the values from it. Now, the, uh, the other thing we have to do now is we have to change the razor page. So I should just be able to copy this stuff over to here and replace the text box with the drop down. Let's see if this works. I go to create, I enter in the new person, I can select which team that I want, create, and then Fred Flintstone's on the Bears. All right, <coughs> question. Notice that what we went in to create.
first option of the drop down is a default, right? Because that's how drop downs work. If you don't specify otherwise, the first option is a default. The problem with this is if you're not careful, you're liable to get a lot of people on the tigers if they don't pay attention and don't change that. Okay? So how can we make it so that they have to select something? How do we make it so that they have to select something? Yeah, put a dummy default value on there. So let's think about that. How are we going to put a dummy default value on here? Let's, let's try to reason it out, even if you don't know how to do it. All right. Do you think that the change is going to be made to the model or to the razor page? Model. Anyone agree or disagree? The model makes sense to me because of this. Remember, the model is supplying the data for the razor page. Right? We've now decided that we want to supply more data. Right? Instead of just having a list of teams, we want to have a dummy entry on the top that says, please select team. So therefore, we want to supply more data. The way that it appears is going to be the same. The drop down is going to appear the same. It's just going to have one more entry in it. So I'm not going to change the razor page because it's still a drop down. It's still going to appear the same. The difference is, is that my list is going to have one more item. So if I look at the model, the question becomes, How do I add one more thing to the list? Okay? Make sense? How do I add one more thing to the list? What's my list? What variable contains my list? No, that's the type of object that the list contains. What's the actual name of my list? Options. So I want to do something to options, right? Now, Lord knows I shouldn't even be saying this. I should turn off the video for this or put a big censored symbol over this or something or turn off the audio. But one way to tell what you can do for an object is just let IntelliSense be your guide. Okay? Now, Oh, let's see. Add. Looks like we can add a new item to it, right? So we can add a new select list item to that list. Okay? So let's try something like this. I'm going to have a select list item called dummy and I'm going to create that object so equals new select list item and there's four constructors for select list item which, if you remember, when we looked at the documentation, that's what we saw. We saw four. And the one that we want is this one that accepts two texts, two strings. The first one being the text, the text being what the user wants to see. So I'm going to put there, and I'm going to say select team. And then the second one's going to be the value. All right. So since it's a dummy value, I'll just put a value of nothing there. 
And then I'm going to add that list item to my list. So this looks like a reasonable answer. And you can almost tell how I'm wording this that this isn't going to be the right answer. <laughs> but we can look. still shows tiger. Oh, it puts select team at the end of the list. Ooh, that's not what we want to do, right? So, we did a good job. We looked at the functions and we found an add. But add wasn't the right function. So, let's look what other functions there are. Oh, I cheated. I started typing. We could scroll down here. We're going to come across an insert function. What's the difference between an insert function? The insert function allows us to put it in a certain position. So when we add to a list, it's like if you've ever done an array list in Java, when you add to an array list, you add to the bottom of the list. With the insert, though, we can put it wherever we want. So we want to put this guy at position 0. And that's where we're going to put the dummy select item. Select list item. Now when we run this, we should get a better result. Now, the first option is select team. What happens if I try to save it? Well, team ID field is required. All right, we're in business. Questions about this? Now, if you want to get fancy, we could use a similar syntax to what we have up here. I could actually not create my dummy variable and do this. And that works too. So instead of creating the dummy as new select item, I can say new select list item, select team, empty string. Now, if we weren't lazy in using IntelliSense, how would we look this up? AS.net, ASP.net list. This talks about all the things that we can do. I think Java has spoiled me because I like Java's documentation. Let's look up methods. There we go. It would have told us that this adds the element at the end of the list. Whereas if I look at insert, it would tell us inserts an element at the specific index. So that seems to be what I would rather do in this case. Any questions about this? 
What I want to do is I want to preview the functionality that we're going to go over uh, next week. Again, how do I want to put this? The stuff that we scaffold is good stuff. We can use a lot of it. For example, the stuff to enter new leagues. That's fine. We'd use that. All right. But we might want functionality that doesn't neatly fit into the whole scaffolding business, all right, to the code that's generated. And therefore, we have to write our own code. That being said, like I talked about at the beginning of class, the code that's scaffold is a good source of examples of how to do stuff. So you can refer to that stuff, even if you don't use it, even if you end up deleting it. All right. So this is a functionality that we are going to look at next week. I have the ability to, and you could probably almost guess where these things came from. I put a roster here, all right? And the roster shows me a list of leagues that I can pick. I can do a search. I can see the teams in that league. And then I can look at their roster. Now you had talked about like an online catalog of things. How would this relate? Maybe this would be the category of items. All right. Like I want to look at jeans. We do a search. And then it would show us the brands of jeans that your store has. Levi's, Lee, Wrangler, whatever. And then when you clicked on the specific uh, brand, it would show you the list of models that fit that. All right. That, <coughs> excuse me. That's what we're going to go over uh, next time. That's what we're going to go over. And it might take a class or two or whatever to go. Once we have these sort of queries down, and we can do sort of any kind of query that we want to and piece the pages together in a certain way, then we'll look at different ways that we can do inserting and updating and deleting that may not be standard. All right? Uh, by standard, I mean the code that you get when you scaffold the items. All right, we're going to end a little bit early today and give you a chance to work on stuff. I hope, knock on wood, that all the issues with versions between the versions in here and the versions in the lab are taken care of. Let me know if you have any problem with that. Um, I will post this example, and uh, I'll come grab my files, be back uh, in lab. All right, see you in lab.